Hello, and thank you for tuning in to the Enersys Learning Series. My name is Greg Laughlin, Product Marketing Manager for Enersys. I'm going to be joined today by two of my colleagues and subject matter experts in outside broadband plant powering and connectivity. Uh, we'll have Toby Peck, Director of Product Management, and Rob Anderson, also a Director in Product Management for Enersys. Today, we'll be discussing how current and future demands in broadband are reshaping the H HFC access network focusing on power requirements for these new architectural changes. Then we'll take a look at the XM31 power supply for cable broadband with new features that'll support the challenges of tomorrow. So let's get started. Uh, we're not gonna spend a lot of time covering specifics with regard to the market drivers, but at a high level, the MSOs are looking to expand into wireless, increase their capacity while optimizing their capital and operational expenses. This is driving a lot of activity and changes to the HFC network. So Rob, I'll start with you. Uh, what changes are we seeing now and in the next 10 years in the outside plant to meet these business objectives? <clears throat> uh, this was a Cable Labs broadband usage report issued just last week, um, indicating that by 2023, the demand for home broadband would literally double. And that, that's kind of a huge undertaking. Operators know this, we all see it. Um, there's a hundred reasons why this is happening, which um, we obviously don't have time to go into, but the result of the increased need for broadband or demand for broadband is that the operators are <clears throat> upgrading their networks. They're enhancing their, their network from the head end through the access network and then how you access data in your home. And uh, if you just go to the next slide, sure. this is a kind of a high level block diagram of some of the potential upgrades that could be happening in the access network over the next few years. There's a combination of things happening here from high speed optics going to new aggregation nodes, which don't exist today. Um, then high-speed optics out to uh, distributed access nodes, remote Fi, remote MacFi devices, um, one point gigahertz amplifiers supporting DOCSIS 4.0, frequency division duplexing up to 1.8 gigahertz, um, 5G fixed wireless access, uh, deep fiber type applications supporting full duplex DOCSIS, traditional uh, EPON, um, and then mobile backhaul and, and enterprise uh, ethernet, a number of things that the cable operator uh, is going to be upgrading or a number of ways their network is going to be upgraded in the future. All of these upgrades, irrespective of which ones they implement in which order, all of them require reliable power. That's what the power icon is showing on this diagram is there's power required in all these locations. And uh, that power has to be very reliable and has to be very robust and consistent for these networks of the future to operate. Can you, do you see a change in where the power is going? For example, with, with things moving out of the head end, you know, distributed, does that mean that there's actually more power required further deep into the network? Yeah, so if you look at some of the architectural changes, you've got, um, digital nodes, distributed access architecture type nodes replacing traditional analog nodes. Those require more power. Um, there are movements to put additional functionality into the DAA physical location. Uh, some you might be familiar with the uh, generic access platform movement, the SCTE committee to uh, create a generic node enclosure and there's talk of putting all kinds of things in there, uh, including edge computing devices, um, radio units, all sorts of, of, of applications are being considered. That just needs power and it needs reliable power. Um, the other thing that's kind of an interesting uh, trend or change is that every one of these devices in the network are essentially edge computing devices from the sense that um, they're CPU driven, they are, they're not analog devices of the past, they're, they're much more power sensitive. A power glitch on any of these devices could cause your network to reset for a period of time while the device reboots, which is a problem if you're going to bring down a, a, a few hundred customers on a DAA node while it reboots for a few minutes. Uh, that's just something that you don't want to have happen. Right, right. And if they want to have this, uh, 
network that they can offer all these advanced services. It seems like having that 100% reliable network is the most valuable thing you have, right? I mean, that's that's what people are going to be looking for is seamless connectivity with no interruption, right? Absolutely. Okay, great, great. And do you do you see the HFC still being the the main provider of this new architecture? It's still distributed act. I mean, they call distributed access. Obviously, it's a distributed network. Is is that all somewhat going to stay the same as far as you use an HFC for power? It absolutely is, particularly in North America where there is coax going to over 80% of the homes in, in North America. Greenfield applications, sure, they'll build fiber in, but the existing coax plant's going to be around for many, many years. And it's obvious that that's going to happen because of the effort that the broadband industry is putting into extending the life of that coax through various RF techniques, modulation, higher, raising the frequency band, um, being able to uh, to transmit more over the existing cable. That's that demand uh, for broadband in the home through the coax will continue on uh, at least for the next 10 to 15 years. So Toby, as the leading provider of HFC powering systems, what is Enersys doing to help address these challenges? Well, I think the, the biggest thing we're focused on right now is our, our newest power supply that we're coming out with is the XM31. Um, you know, it, it's focused on some very key pieces that Rob talked about. Uh, obviously, one of the things when, when Rob talked about that, the power and how it's laying out and uh, the sensitivity of some of the loads, um, the criticality of that power is, is a huge piece. Um, it, it's not just sensitive, but it's also uh, really, really leading to brand new services that new customer types, uh, wireless um, stuff in the home that is very different. and and. Um, things like an aggregation node. If you lose an aggregation node, you drop a huge chunk of homes and customers. Um, the other piece that's really interesting, um, and a lot of the stuff you're hearing right now is a lot of um, a lot of the MSOs are seeing residential nodes now much more like a business services node. So there's there's not a, this tiering of who's important and who's not. It's everybody's critical because everybody's you know everybody's working from home, uh, and so there's this huge need for reliable power. You know, Rob mentioned if you if you drop a DA a node for some reason or, or some of this new edge computing devices, you might lose a bunch of homes and people on on webinars much like this one who are in the middle of something that's critical to their business. So, um, you know, our really big focus for this was obviously reliable power, um, and that's that's what we've done for the last forty years. And so, as we've developed technology, um, the XM3. Uh, was just such a robust platform and, and we did a lot to advance. Um, we're leveraging a lot of the technology from that. Um, the, the Faro that we used for the XM3 is, is the same one that we're embedding in this 3.1. Um, the Intelligent Inverter, same thing. The, the dual output controller, uh, which gives you the opportunity to potentially segment and independently isolate two legs of, of power uh, to ensure that you can kind of make sure things that happen on one leg don't necessarily carry to the other. Um, and then all the remote management pieces we're doing um, this is really interesting because we've added an optical ethernet or sorry, an optical, uh, monitoring port, the SFP. Um, oh yeah, I saw that on there. Yeah. That, yeah. That's new to this model, right? It is. And it, there are a lot of applications now where our customers are leveraging the, the power in the HFC, uh, in the coaxial network, like Rob mentioned, it's, it's everywhere. Um, but for some reason might not have DOCSIS, uh, you know, fiber based sort of applications. And customers still want to be able to monitor and understand what's going on with the power because it is so critical. Right. Um, you know, the other the other piece is obviously DOCSIS 3.1, and um, you know DOCSIS 3.1 has some huge advantages. And you know, I'll kind of go to Rob to to throw that out there. You know, Rob, what do you see as some of the biggest advantages of of 3.1 in a power supply? Sure. Thanks, Toby. Well, you know, it's obvious that you don't need the speed of DOCSIS 3.1 in the power supply. The, the telemetry that you're reading is, uh, is, is not that much of it, but there are other benefits. So for example, we have added a auto attenuation feature into our DOCSIS 3.1 modem, such that as the RF plant uh, levels change, um, called breathing in the RF network, um, the input attenuation to the RF circuit in the modem is automatically adjusted so that over time, as that, that uh, 
RF level changes either with normal weather breathing or with some sort of anomaly in the plant, um, then we maintain your RF connection. It basically re eliminates or drastically reduces any future service calls on the power supply just to look at an RF level or a drop to modem. Um, it's big uh, when you don't have to visit a piece of equipment. Um, it's, a, it's a major cost savings for an operator. So that's one thing. Um, the DOCSIS modems have DOCSIS 3.1 proactive network maintenance or PNM built into them. Um, this is this is big for some operators. I was just speaking to um, one of our large North American based operators last week. They updated me that as of last week they were polling just under 50 million DOCSIS devices every day on their network, gathering network statistics and information to do diagnostics and troubleshooting proactively so that they could find problems before they became service affecting events. Our power supplies are part of that number. And what they're able to do with that information from the power supply is look at information from individual homes, information from the power supplies, and in their unique position in the HFC plant, be able to triangulate on any issues or problems and point to literally right down to a particular, uh, maybe a tap or a connector that is having a, a problem, maybe it's corroded or, or, or broken or, or in some way needs to be replaced. And they can find those, those um, issues fairly quickly. And the power supply is part of that. The other thing about DOCSIS 3.1 is it really is the norm. You don't see cable operators um, installing new DOCSIS 3.0 equipment in their homes. What that means is that the demand for the DOCSIS 3.0 integrated circuits, the silicon, is going to go away pretty quick. When the demand for those 3.0 or earlier DOCSIS chips go away, it means that they're harder to get. They're, they're, the lead time goes up, they're more expensive. And so moving the power supply to DOCSIS 3.1 makes a lot of sense so that at some point when those uh, DOCSIS 3.0 chips end up going end of life, uh, the operators aren't stuck with a, with a problem trying to get stuff that they, that they uh, uh, are trying to install um, equipment that is no longer available in the network. Excellent. Very interesting. I got a question for you guys. Um, while we're talking about the, uh, you mentioned that SFP cage. I was wondering if maybe you could touch on that a little bit more. I know that we got into um, a product that I worked on when I worked for you um, in doing some, some power monitoring at fiber only locations. Uh, it, it's a unique, somewhat of a unique uh, case but it seems to be growing. I mean, wh what are you seeing out there for the need? I mean, this seems like a, a, a big deal for this new power supply to get you in areas where you don't have DOCSIS for that communication. Yeah, I, you know, there's a lot of applications we're seeing it. Um, you know, V-hubs are a great example where you've got equipment you're powering that is very important, critical to the network, uh, but it's fiber in, fiber out. So there's no, there's no RF, there's no coax to be able to um, pull communications off for monitoring. Um, one of the other ones that we're seeing and we've heard a lot of use cases for is, is larger MDUs in cities. Um, again, where you might be powering a node at the bottom of a, a you know, uh, 10, 20 story MDU with a lot of customers in it, um, but you don't necessarily have RF coming into the building. Um, you're, you're still backhauling off the fiber sort of thing. So those are two of the bigger ones that we've seen. Um, there's also some places where the network is evolving um, and coax is being used to power um, but as the network has evolved, you might not necessarily have um, RF in a section of plant that traditionally did. Um, you know, fiber deep is a great potential uh, area like this where some places in an existing or a newer fiber deep network, um, you might not necessarily have RF communication between two points, uh, maybe even between an aggregation node eventually and, and uh, a DAA node, for an example. Um, so there's a lot of places that as the network evolves, you've, you've got this infrastructure for powering, but there may or may not long-term be RF at, at present at those locations. And so it's, it's really important to have something that still allows you to, to monitor, <laughs> monitor and manage, excuse me, the, uh, the power at the location because it's still a very important critical piece of their infrastructure. No, oh, thanks. That's, that actually helps a lot. Um, one last question on that is with SFP, correct me if I'm wrong, but that opens it up to either other types of connectivity, right? Couldn't you put like an ethernet SFP in there and have a, like a cellular mode if you needed some other form of 
communication, for example? Yeah, long term, we have an SFP cage, which means that there's a lot of different stuff that you can do with it. Right now, um, we're very just focused on one gig Ethernet. Um, we're working on some conversions. You know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of MSOs that are not necessarily having one gig in their plant anymore. They might be going to 10 gigs. So we're looking at potentially having a 10 to one converter. Um, but yeah, that cage will give us the opportunity to potentially look at um, what we might be able to do with other technologies as well. Um, okay. you know, short term, it's, it's still very focused on EPON, but um, could be something that, that we can grow it as, as new technologies become available and necessary. All right. All right. I see you also wanted to talk a little bit about uh, batteries. I know that's something that you have uh, many years of experience around and what can you tell us there? Yeah. I mean, I, I think as always with any of our power supplies, the goal is to maximize the, the runtime and the life of the, the energy storage that is with the power supply. Uh, that's part of being a standby power supply is, is having the capacity for backup. And those batteries are obviously the, the linchpin to that. Um, so we do a lot within the context of the power supply to ensure that we're maximizing that life and, and the runtime with it. Um, you know, the five stage charger is a huge piece where um, depending on the battery that's in the power supply, we allow it to charge uh, that maximizes that particular chemistry's uh, life and, and capacity. Uh, you know, the great one is the, the rest mode that is um, very useful for our HP or our TPPL batteries. Uh, and coming to our, our HP Plus, um, that rest mode actually allows the battery to be off charge for 18 hours a day uh, and potentially extends the life of the battery of up to a year. So again, it doesn't sound like much, but you know, when you're talking 15 to 20 percent on an investment that's, that is millions and millions of dollars across an entire network, um, it's, a, it's a great asset to know that you're extending that as far as you can. Sure, um, yeah. The, the, the smart alpha guard that we have as well, uh, again, battery balancing, but um, does a lot more, gives great information on the battery voltages, um, helps to ensure that they're being balanced, but then alarms when they're not being balanced. So you know um, that you've got something that needs to be dealt with. So, And then the Apps Plus platform, which I'll probably talk in and out about a lot, but um, is designed to give as much data on the batteries as possible. Um, specifically, generally, it's focused very much on the health and runtime. You know, how, many, how much life is left in my battery and how much runtime do I currently have? Um, but there's a lot of other data that we're looking to glean uh, that's a little bit more advanced analytics as well. So. Okay. So, yeah, so adding that intelligence into the power supply, you know, this isn't just a Faro, uh, a dumb Faro sitting out there. This is a, a very intelligent uh, piece of equipment that is, you know, ensures the reliability, right? Yeah. Intelligence is going to be the, the biggest key in, in network reliability uh, in the near future and, and even today. Anything that you can glean that can improve your ability to really target your budget and ensure that you can keep your systems reliable uh, is, is absolutely huge. And, you know, it's 2020. Um, the use of data, big data, to, to be able to analyze and, and uh, do AI and BI on your, on your plant is going to be um, such a huge factor in being able to save money uh, and focus on making your plant more reliably, reliable in a very targeted way. Um, you, mentioned, so, uh, you mentioned cost. <laughs> saving money that's a big deal um i thought maybe that might be a good uh, way to segment to this next slide uh to show how you know all these additions to the power supply actually lead to the to the bottom line again the one of the biggest focuses is reliability but also um improving total cost of ownership uh, and I, I think they go hand in hand um you know our customers want to do what they can to make their network as reliable as possible. But just like everybody, we have limited resources and um, anything we can do to, to make that process uh, save money and, and effective from a cost saving standpoint is, is going to improve reliability. So, you know, um, battery service and replacement, I talked a lot about um, what we do to show life and runtime of battery. Those are great indicators that let customers know uh, when battery health is good and when it's bad. Uh, yeah, explain how that, because there's, there's a CapEx element to that uh, as well as an operational expense right. element to the battery. Explain that a little bit. Sure. You know, from a, from a CapEx standpoint, um, our goal is to give very concise information when batteries do need to be replaced and, and allow customers to really budget for CapEx upgrades on, uh, on sites, understanding exactly when batteries need to be pulled out. But from an OPEX standpoint, um, you know, having this information means that 
things like a, a yearly or a bi-yearly maintenance cycle doesn't necessarily need to happen the same. Um, you can really focus on sites that you know you need to do maintenance on because you've got information. Uh, and so now instead of looking at 100% of your plant every single year that you need to have somebody go out and touch, um, you can focus on the, the sites that really need it. Uh, and having that information really allows you to do that. Well, you're probably also eliminating those emergency truck rolls, right? Because somebody didn't plan that they, you know, weren't looking at the health of these batteries. You find out the hard way. Imagine that's got to be expensive as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a that's another huge piece. Is it's nothing's accidental at this point. Uh, it's all right. information that you've had, and for the most part, uh, barring the occasional catastrophic uh, issue where you have a cell drop or something that you can't really predict. 99.99% um, of the time, you know when your batteries are going to go bad and you can, you can plan for it. And planning is obviously a huge savings when it comes to OPEX. Sure. And, and you mentioned the uh, extended life of the batteries. You know, that's fewer truck rolls right there, right? If you're rolling your truck every seven years instead of, well, whatever the yeah, numbers absolutely. are, I don't know the with, numbers. Yeah. But. With some of the charger advantages and the, the smart alpha guard, but the battery balancing, you're going to get extra life out of the batteries. And when you do, that obviously saves you truck rolls in the long run. So Great. Cool. Yeah, I really wanted to highlight that. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, do you want to go into any of these other, I mean, it, it's interesting, all these other, like you said, the, the, a lot of the savings comes into truck rolls. How often do you got to send somebody out to do something? Right. What about the, the, the replaceable, the removable and burr module? That seems like it also could be a CapEx and OpEx saving type of situation. Yeah, I mean, I think in general, knowing that you don't necessarily have to completely replace a power supply, um, or pull out a power supply and send the entire thing in every single time you have uh, an inverter issue uh, is going to be a huge um, OPEX and CAPEX savings. Um, it's, a, it's a huge advantage to be able to remove in the field and potentially even do some small troubleshooting, um, but just in general, be able to, to remove an inverter, have one simply on the truck and just place a new one in and then send one in for, for service. Um, you know, Basic, basic fact, uh, an inverter is, is about 10 pounds of power supply is 65 to 70. So, you know, it's, it's just easier and simpler to, to have to just replace that. Uh, obviously, there's a, there's a cost of ownership sort of issue there, too, where you don't have to send the whole thing in. It's just an inverter replacement. Right, right. Imagine the shipping cost probably a lot less just weight based on that. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, <laughs> and that's why it's a, a, a huge potential saving. So, All right. Excellent. Excellent. Um, anything else you want to uh, uh, add on, on this slide? Um, you know, I think a couple things. One, uh, the remote management backhaul. Rob talked about all the amazing things about having a 3-1 in uh, a power supply. And just there's a lot of value there. Um, one thing that we've done with this power supply is uh, under the hood, we've kind of taken some of the pieces and moved them around in such a way that we've really improved how data flows within the infrastructure of, of the power supply itself. And what's that, what that's allowed us to do is, um, one, give much more accurate information when it comes to uh, input and output, uh, voltages, uh, currents, power, that sort of stuff. Um, we've, we've improved the accuracy of that data significantly. And uh, that's a huge play to customers right now because we're starting to look into things like grid metrics and some other uh, platforms that are really understanding the, the effect of utilities um, from a cost standpoint and also a reliability standpoint on the outside plant. Um, so having more accurate data there is, is going to be a big play. Um, one of the other things that we are, can kind of do with that now is um, the speed of the infrastructure and how it can communicate under the hood. And again, not something you'd see necessarily, but gives us the ability to show advanced power analytics. So not just how much uh, voltage and current am I using, but I can actually do a waveform capture on the voltage and current when an event happens and understand, you know, did I see something unusual from the input power um, at, the, at the microsecond or cycle sort of level uh, and really be able to analyze that power to uh, a very, very minute detail uh, to understand some of the things that are going on. And you know, Rob mentioned the, a lot of the edge compute stuff. Um, when, when you see glitches in some of those edge compute things, they happen um, faster than I can switch on a light, a light switch. Um, and so our ability to capture that, store it, and then allow it to be shipped uh, back to the, the NOC via the, uh, the network, uh, I think it's something that really is going to provide a huge advantage in, in diagnosing and, and troubleshooting issues with some of those advanced compute sort of network elements. 
Interesting. Great. Yeah, it's to me, I look at it, you know, you take a step back and you look at the evolution of just powering in the architecture, you know, the 15 or so years that I've been at Alpha. And I know that Rob's been there a lot longer. You about the same as me. Yeah. Um, going to where you're actually pinpointing, you know, you're, you're getting into specific troubleshooting that specific locations where, you know, 15, 20 years ago, it, it, it it wasn't so much the case. It was you're really trying to control the big fires and just get get in general things under control. Uh, I think it, it's like that in a lot of the network now. I think you're seeing is they're getting to the point where it's really you're able to fine tune it and and really get the high performance out of it. I think that's great. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Our customers' ability to absorb and and use data is so much more vast than it was. Like I said, 10, 15 years ago when you and I started working here, um, you know. Just, just understanding where you failed a self-test was something that was a, a, a big yeah. uh, big ask for a lot of folks. And, and now they're taking data and using it in so many different ways and, and plugging it into their own AI engines. And so we're just trying to figure out what the valuable data is that customers can use to really, really understand what's going on in the network. Yeah. Yeah. No, that was a good point. I remember one of my first customer visits found out that a major cable operator was getting so many alarms from their power system that they ended up disabling most of them just because they couldn't keep up. And that was when they first turned the lights up on monitoring. And, you know, their first thought was, oh my God, this is terrible. And then it was, wow, this really gives us vi visibility to how much work we need to put into our network. And it took them time, but you know, like we said, now they're, they're at a point where they've addressed a good chunk of these, these issues over time. Yeah, Bob, did you want to comment on that? I was just going to say that the, the trend towards AI is we're really starting to see that. We're getting questions about um, self-healing equipment, self-diagnosing equipment. Operators are moving away from just uh, using the, the dashboard of uh, red, yellow, green lights to tell them when to roll a truck and moving more towards the realm of networks that can manage themselves. Yeah. The, uh, the XM31 with the app card allows us to upgrade with remote firmware upgrades in the future to accomplish some things that we don't even know we need to do today. So as operators tell us, hey, we really want this information or we want it looked at in this way, or we want your power quality data to give us a, uh, a quality metrics that's calculated in, in these ways, those kind of things can be added to the XM31 and provided as a, as a future enhancement um, for this AI type of, of network that we're moving towards. Yeah. Good. I was going to ask we've if we've actually, if we've actually that leveraged that with customers a little bit already. I mean, we've, we've done that where we work with a customer who had a request on some data they wanted to be able to understand, uh, programmed it into the apps card, and then used that remote firmware to push it out for the XM3. And that process is going to be um, faster and, and better for the XM31 as it comes out too. So yeah, that's a huge piece of the architecture is having this kind of living ability to, to make adaptations to what we're monitoring and passing to the customers. That's a big deal because, like you said, I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of these power supplies out there, and you, you want some new functionality. You can't just go out and replace. I mean, obviously, you know, as a vendor, you'd probably like to see that, but the reality is, you know, you have to be able to adapt. So I, that sounds like that we were really kind of thinking ahead when we added in that apps card and, and kind of that future ability to put in extra intelligence that, you know, we may not even know what that is today. Yeah. And again, it's something you can't overemphasize to Rob's point. Um, it's not just, here's three features we put in. It's, it's something that allows us to continually add new features as customers are interested in seeing new data points. And, you know, I think that's something that we need to make sure that our customers really understand is what do you want to know today? And we can, we can make it happen for you. Is there anything uh, coming up down the road that you want to shed any light, any, any uh, inside uh, sneak peeks or, Toby, I think that one's to you. I don't mean to put you on the spot. I know I wasn't planning on asking you questions about the future products, but is there anything that, that you know, we should know about or is it a wait and see? Well, that's a great question. We're, we're looking at, um, you know, a dozen different things, very focused around um, a lot of what Rob talked about before with where the network's going. You know, is, is the solution more power? Is the solution easier power to scale? Um, is it both? Are there better ways to get power um, transmitted across the network uh, and then always always better information back to our customers and 
not just back to the customers, but when a technician's standing in front of a, a power supply, how do they quickly know and understand exactly what they need to do? Um, how do we help our, our customers be as effective as possible with every action they take out in the outside plant? And, you know, that's a huge focus of ours going forward is intelligence uh, and efficiency and um, scalability of power. And those are kind of some of the big things we're looking at for the, the next generation of powering. All right. Great. Thank you. Well, I think that's uh, just going to just about do it for us. I think we should wrap up. Uh, that was a really great session. Uh, very good dialogue going there. And uh, so, we, we, you know, we covered the outside powering, the XM 3.1 power supply, obviously designed to give you better reliability and lower your cost of ownership, while adding features to support management and remote fiber only connectivity. Uh, I want to thank both Rob and Riley, uh, Riley, <laughs> Rob and Toby for joining me today. Uh, it really it was good to have your expertise on the call and, and I, I thank you for pulling yourself away from working on those next gen products. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Greg. You betcha. I also want to thank our audience for downloading and watching this video discussion and we hope you found it uh, useful and informative. Uh, if you want to learn more, please visit our website at www.alpha.com slash broadband and look for the link at the top for email updates. You can also follow us on LinkedIn. Thanks again, and we hope you tune in to future videos.